This is a sermon from St. Paul's Church, Brookfield, Connecticut, transforming lives through Jesus. For more information, go to www.stpaulsbrookfield.com. My wife, Tara, and I were recently on a road trip, and we passed by a billboard that said, limp in, leap out. Limp in, leap out. And I looked more closely, and it was an advertisement for a tire shop right off the exit ramp. And I thought, what a great slogan for a church. Limp in, leap out. Right? We are, after all, a hospital for sinners, as we say, are we not? We are, in a sense, a repair shop for the broken. And in what we say here at St. Paul's is this. We are, by God's grace, a healing oasis. A healing oasis. And we have before us, from John's Gospel, an illustration that inspires this very vision we have today where there is an incredible healing in an oasis of sorts. It's actually at a location known as the Pool of Bethesda. This location was unearthed by archaeologists in the late 1800s, and at that time, they weren't really sure it existed. But all of a sudden, they discovered it. And they realized that this miracle of Jesus that John recounts is as true today as it ever was. And there were two pools. One was so deep you could dive in it. And the other one was a bit more shallow. It was at a place called the Sheep's Gate, which is where the shepherds would lead their flocks in to wash their lambs before taking them to the temple for the sacrifice. And so you had two pools, one for bathing and one for washing the sheep. This bathing pool was very unique. Underneath it, <clears throat> we understand, were some underground springs. But at the time, they thought it was, through a superstitious viewpoint, angels that would occasionally stir up the water. And the idea was that if you needed healing, you had to get to that water first because the first person to get in it would be healed. And so we have this context where Jesus has come to Jerusalem for one of the feasts. There were three major feasts for the Jews. And if you lived within 16 miles of Jerusalem, you were required to be there. And so here was Jesus, fulfilling the law, not coming to abolish it, but to make it complete. There are a number of people called invalids around this pool, under five shelters, five porticos. And here's a man who has been there for 38 years, under the blazing sun, unable to get to those waters when they're stirred up. Just think about the lack of peace in this poor man. We see Jesus' compassion in singling him out. And we also see what we call the doctrine of divine election, which is a doctrine that hinges upon the truth of Scripture that tells us things like this. We love God because God first loved us. And as Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I've chosen you. Why, Lord? We don't know. This is God's sovereign, perfect, majestic plan. Why are you here, my friends? Why are we chosen by the Savior? It's by his hand of grace, not by our works or self-effort. No, not at all. This is the love of the Lord. That for whatever reason God has purposed it, we've been chosen. That's an invitation to rejoice in his peace always and everywhere, no matter what's going on in our lives. You're chosen. That's it. Well, here's an example of what this can look like in this one particular individual. He's focused on healing. He can't seem to get it on his own. His self-effort isn't working. He doesn't have people around him to help him. So here comes Jesus, the good shepherd, as he'll later call himself in John's gospel, seeing this lost sheep, picking him out from the 99, as it were, and it's, again, in this context where historically sheep would be taken and be washed and presented 
blameless and spotless for the sacrifice in the temple. So the good shepherd says to this man, do you want to be made well? In other words, do you want to be healed? Notice the man doesn't answer Jesus. You'd think he'd say, oh, absolutely. Whoever you are, yes. He complains. It's a bit of self-pity, perhaps. He says, I've been waiting here. I don't have anybody to help me. Jesus says, get up or rise up, based on the translation. Take up your mat and walk. Now, that word that Jesus uses occurs elsewhere in the Gospels when he tells someone who's dead to get up. Rise up, little girl, he says in one instance. So the idea here is that Jesus is offering healing, not just physical healing, but healing of the soul, bringing life out of death. This man's life is about to change forever. And that's why he said, take up your mat. Meaning, don't think about holding back a provision for relapse. Don't think about maybe keeping your mat on the ground because you might need it later. No, take up everything and go forward. Or as sometimes we pray, Lord, may we leave this time of worship by a different way than through which we came. And that's our prayer for us this morning, that we'll be so touched by God's spirit that we'll leave in a different way in our hearts as God's mysterious electing healing takes place. So the man never really answered Jesus. And notice this, he doesn't thank him. I'm going to have to take you further into John's gospel for us to fully understand the context here. The man goes to the temple, which must have been a thrill for him because as a paralyzed individual, he would have never been able to go into the temple. And what is he doing? He's walking around with his mat. Now, the Hebrew law said that on the Sabbath, you cannot bear a burden. That is, you can't do work. And so this man's working it. He's walking with his mat. And so he's picked up by the authorities who say, hey, what are you doing? Now, did you know you could be stoned for this? That rarely happened, but that was the law. So the man has not thanked Jesus. He's not really answered Jesus when he said, do you want to be made well? And now he blames Jesus. He says, this guy uh, who told me to get up and take up my mat and walk, he's the one you should be talking to. And they say, well, who is he? And he goes, I don't know. So this man hasn't even stopped to behold who Jesus really is. See, this is us. Oh, it is. Come on, right? <laughs> All those times we didn't really answer the Lord the way we could have, those moments where we weren't truly grateful, where we're not looking for Jesus, we're not even recognizing him, and yet he comes for us. This is the heart of election. He chooses us. And just to make the point, John in his gospel tells us that in the midst of the throng of people who are picking on this guy for carrying his mat, here comes Jesus. He finds him again. And he says, look, you're now made whole. Go and sin no more. Meaning... You don't have to be perfect or get your whole life together in order to be walking without sin. No, the wholeness is the starting point, the healing, the salvation. And then we walk in what we call sanctification, which is a journey that meanders all over the place, as we know. That's why we repent. That's why we seek healing. That's why we keep coming back together to be touched by the Savior's unconditional love. But the story goes on. The religious authorities come to the man again and, and ask him what he's doing. And he points out Jesus. There he is. And the next thing we know, they want to kill Jesus. So this man is completely unworthy in every way for this healing. And yet Jesus keeps coming after him. And he does that for us. This is the freedom of what it means to be loved by God. That yes, we have human responsibility, but it comes after the gift of election or being chosen by grace alone. And that's when our lives take off in a different direction. This was the sheep's gate. This was a broken little sheep. The good shepherd essentially lifted him up by the power of God. As Jesus would say later in this chapter, God the Father has the power to raise the dead. I have the same power. That's what he just did for this little lamb who's now been made whole. Who knows what the rest of his life would look like, we're not told, but one can only imagine. 
but his gratitude, his right answers, his good responses, his self-identity for responsibility, those things are not in play and they don't matter because God chooses his own in love for purposes we can't fully understand, but we live into it in complete surrender and peace, we pray. Healing takes many forms, physical, but what this reading points us to is it's also emotional and spiritual. No longer is this man living in painful isolation. He's now been brought into community and he'll eventually come to understand certain things. And that's the path for all of us, isn't it? How did we come to faith? What's happening? We pray that as we hear the Lord's voice, the good shepherd will obey. And as we obey, then might we understand, maybe. But his love is nevertheless all around us and within us through the Holy Spirit. He's here, we can feel him. The Holy Spirit. Calling us to rise up. To come alive again. To walk. And to not look back. In the 20th century, there was a very well-known Methodist revivalist and missionary named Eli Stanley Jones. He would later be called the Billy Graham of India. He had a powerful influence in India. He guided Gandhi, among many others. And Martin Luther King Jr. would later say it was because of Eli Stanley Jones's witness that he would take the path of nonviolence in the civil rights movement. That is the impact this man had. He was a confidant of FDR right before the Second World War. God had anointed him. He influenced so many, and yet one of his favorite stories was about a revival church, a tent meeting on the frontier. And in the front, they had what was called the morning bench. It was a place people could go for prayer, for repentance, for crying out to the Lord. Whatever you had to offer God, this was the safe place to do it. And one day, just before the service began, a literal girl holding a broken doll in her arms came up the aisle, and according to Eli Stanley Jones, she looked at the pastor and she said, as she then looked at the morning bench, is this the place where God mends broken hearts? That's the church. That's who God wants us to be. A healing oasis where we share and drink of the one spirit together. A safe place where we can cry out to the Lord no matter where we are, no matter how much the heart hurts. You know, C.S. Lewis said that mental pain or emotional pain and physical pain are both equally concerning. And he said, however... It's a lot more acceptable to say, you know, my tooth hurts. People understand what a toothache is. That's where we get empathy. But if you say my heart hurts, that's not always understood by another. But that's a sacred journey as well, to find that deep healing wherever we hurt and know that our Lord Jesus understands. He's there. He sees the heart. He holds our hearts. He mends our hearts through his Holy Spirit. So we come to the mourner's bench and we also rejoice at that same bench as we come just as we are and we realize that we're here by God's grace alone, by God's electing love. That's how we know we belong. We limp and we leap out. And the church in many ways does its best work on the exit ramps of life. Have you noticed that? When we're broken down or when our treads are worn out, we come off the exit ramp and we're open for new beginnings. We're open for help. We're open for whatever we might need from outside of ourselves to be able to get back on the road. The church isn't as effective by standing in the middle of the highway with people who are rolling on saying, hey, come by, notice us. <laughs> it's the exit ramps of life where we are suffering from addiction, breakdowns, where we're worn out. That's where Jesus, through us, as the head of the church, does his best work. 
So we're parked at the exit ramp. We want to welcome those who are limping so that we together can leap out to whatever God has next. It's happening here. It's always happened with the Church of Jesus, and it will continue. Because God is here, and God has elected us in his love, and says, rest in me, be at peace. I'm at work. Rise up. Come to life. The life that only I can give as you drink from the one spirit in this oasis of love. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.